Hey, Todd, thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, give us a little background on yourself. So, Todd Siegler, uh, I work at Salesforce now. I've, I've been there for all, coming up on nine years. I uh, was at Apple for around eight years, largely been in enterprise sales for the last decade or so. Before that, it was more education and government, uh, but uh, happy to be here with you. Cool. Why sales? Why sales? That was, you know, early on in my in my life, not even my career, I just enjoyed working with people and uh, a lot of funny stories my parents could tell you about it, but I'll give you one hilarious one. My sister was uh, a Girl Scout and she didn't want the prizes. She didn't care. And I thought, I can do this. And I actually had a little sideshow, which was my brother. He was a cute little kid. And I brought him around. I think I sold the second most cookies in the country that year wow. uh, for my sister and just got all the prizes. But, uh, you know, just early on, I, I liked working with people. I liked figuring out challenges. I liked trying to figure out how to get people to, to say yes and, and be interested in things. And obviously, not just cookies, but, uh, you know, sort of bigger things. And uh, it's, it's just been a, a fun journey. And you made your brother your first SE? He was my SC. He didn't do much. He just he carried the cookies and, and looked cute. But I did learn that I sold more cookies when he was with me. Yeah, a little team effort. And how did you make the transition to like enterprise sales? From I mean, I'm sure there was a lot between cookies and enterprise. But... There was, yeah. You know, so most of my career, I, I had done education and government sales, and that was at Apple, at Lexmark before that. And the pivot to enterprise was not nearly as difficult because of what I had learned at Apple. And it was really about storytelling. And so enterprise sales is, for me, it's really about setting a vision. And that vision, it pulls together not just things about the customer, about the challenges they're facing, and really sort of seeing those things, but it pulls together your own internal team uh, behind this common goal. So that, that's been sort of the, the pivot maybe that I've made over my career, but I think Apple really set me up for it. And, and uh, at Salesforce, it took me to a different level. Because that educational state and local, that's a tough market. You know, I, I think that all markets are kind of tough. You know, you're always working against smart other salespeople yeah. and you know, each of the markets poses its own challenges and you deal with people of different types of intelligence, you know, uh, smartness and education and what makes a, you know, whether it's a superintendent or a leader at a university, what they're focused on is definitely different than what an enterprise is. But there are a lot of commonalities, you know, each of them has challenges that they're dealing with. And it's really about, for me, just diving into those challenges, actually feeling those challenges for myself, imagining how I would deal with them and coming up with a way that together we can do something special to help address those. Instead of focusing in on what you do and how it's different and better. and Yeah, I think that's like a trap that salespeople tend to fall into. You know, yep. we, we tend to believe what our company sells more than the challenges our customers face. And why they and want to buy. What's that? Instead of why they want to buy or change or fix something. Yeah. I mean, it comes down to their challenges are, they have nothing to do necessarily with your company and what your company's goals are. And so I, I think that sitting with their challenges and feeling them and thinking, can we help on some of these, you know, and how would we go about doing that? But there's a lot of empathizing with where they are today. And, you know, one of the interesting things is I've always maintained, you know, with enterprise sales that because people will say, well, is it good? You know, do you want to sell to a company that's zooming up and growing really fast? Or do you want to sell to a company that isn't doing so well? And I, I always think, you know, each of them just poses different challenges. Like the growth company needs to continue that growth trajectory or else shareholders probably get upset. Yeah. And the company that is struggling, 
they need to figure out how to deal with that, how to fix it and how to write, you know, where they're going from a direction perspective. So every company has their challenges, every, you know, educational institution or government faces those as well. And what's surprising, if you can get them talking about those challenges, they just go on and on on because no one wants to listen. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, people don't like other people's problems. We like our own problems. We like talking about what, what our problems are. And the funny thing is people may not necessarily want to hear about those, but there is something to be said about listening and really an active listening and not just hearing something and then immediately saying how your solution is going to magically fix this, but really, you know, diving into it and exploring it. And sometimes it's not even you. I had an interesting experience with a superintendent way back in my career with Apple. And I I went to him and he was angry at me. And I had known this guy for a while and he was really upset. And I thought, you know, this is not like the superintendent. I've been friends with him for a while. We've known each other for a while. Like what's going on? And I actually asked him and it turns out that his son was experiencing a life altering, like a really real problem. It had nothing to do with me. But if I didn't stop and keep digging, sort of peeling those onion layers back, I would have never figured that out. And it actually brought us closer. So, you know, a lot of things are just getting to the heart of the problem, because if you can get to the heart of the problem, then, you know, with that case, obviously it's, it's related to his own personal life and it just brought us closer, which builds trust. But if it's the enterprise or the educational institution challenge and you dig at it and you really understand it, chances are you can show a lot better how your solution could help with that. But uh, if you don't dig, it, what you're sharing is surface level information that can generally be applied to any company. You know, it's just what you do versus how you can help. Yeah. And did you choose big companies or did big companies choose you or? So when I, when I came to Salesforce, it was kind of interesting because I was making a pretty big pivot from, you know, traditional education and government to enterprise. And I had gotten a really strong recommendation from a former uh, exec at Apple into a few enterprise companies. And there were questions about me and about whether I could handle enterprise sales. And I thought it laughable at the time. I I understand it a little bit more now, but for me, it just wasn't a big pivot. But for the company uh, to consider me, it actually was something important. And one of the things that they put me through uh, when I was doing the interview, which was, I mean, I've never done more interviews in my life. I think I probably did 10 or 12. But the, the last thing was you have 48 hours with this enterprise company, which you will be working with if you get this job and with our solutions and tell us how you would sell them and how you would work with this organization and who you'd work with and put together the deal that you'd bring to life. The very interesting thing is that 48 hours, I probably have never worked harder. You know, it's Mm -hmm. a great opportunity and I was excited about it and wanted the job. But that opportunity, actually, a year and a half later, uh, we had one of the biggest deals in the company as a result of it. And it was just thinking through how all these things fit together. And I I think that that gets to a lot of why vision is so important, because you have to sort of think through in a lot of steps, not just at a surface level, why it makes sense, but what the pains are and you know, how your solutions relate to solving those pains and who you work with is also similarly important. I mean, a lot of people measure their, the fulfillment of their day or whether they did their job well by activity. And I know that you often talk about that. To me, I, I have less probably, I, I send less emails than just about anybody at our company, but I send better emails than I think most people at the company. Because I really take time to make sure, is this the right human being? Why am I choosing this person to send this message, especially when it's a first message? And how am I going to get that person to realize that a conversation with me could actually be meaningful? 
Um, so I, I spent a lot of time there and uh, that, that vision sort of 48 hours of how you're going to get there. I mean, I didn't know anything about Salesforce. I didn't know anything about this company that I was going to work with, hadn't used Salesforce previously. And, you know, it was just sort of figuring it out and this determination of, I, I can get there. I just need to dig and dig. And where do you think this empathetic skill came from? Was there some part of your life that developed it or? Yeah, you know, my, so my dad is a cognitive psychologist. He, he studies how kids learn mathematics. And he always has brought a thoughtfulness to how he helps me understand things. And also that things are never surface deep. You know, we see somebody who's walking down the street and they look angry or they look upset. And we just think that person's upset. But we all look that way at times. Sometimes we, <laughs> traffic, everyone looks on times. an airplane. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that it was his influence largely. Um, and I would say definitely my mom's love that got me to realize people are really complicated and we do things for our own reasons. And it's not like it's one reason, it's a whole host of reasons. And it, you know, it's fun to sort of explore that and look into why, why do people do those things? And, you know, why do they keep doing things even when they may not be the best things for them to do? And uh, I, I think that that continual questioning, which I like doing, uh, get you know, it becomes a, a fun sort of almost. I, I brainstorm and do a lot of mind mapping, and the the way the reason that I do it is that I start exploring things that I wouldn't have otherwise. One thing relates to another, and I have another question and another question, and it sort of just gives me ideas of where do you go and how do you keep diving deeper and deeper into people and why they do things. Well, when you said mind mapping. <clears throat> One of the key distinctions I find with great salespeople is they write things down. They don't just try and go from gut because gut is good in a simple sale. But when you're dealing with complexity, many people, strategy, long time gaps in between talking, you know, you're getting hints about what's really going on within the organization. Yeah, you know, the mind mapping is helpful for me to sort of think through what I know now and what I don't know. What you don't know. Yeah, which what I don't know, candidly, is much more important than what I do. Yes. It's sort of where I know I need to go. It's like, huh, I don't know that. Or this new person, what are they all about? And I, I need to learn about them. Um, one of the things that I always find very interesting and this is dating back to, there's a very influential person in my career. And I often talk about this guy, his name was Mr. Salvo. He was my speech teacher in high school. And it sounds like, how could a high school speech teacher have this much of an influence? And I would say more than anybody in college, uh, from a teaching perspective, he had an influence in my life. And he taught me a lot of different things. One, you mentioned the gap in speaking. People think that you should answer, you should have an answer for everything and you should immediately respond because there's this tension, especially when it's a customer and you have to fill that tension gap where it's actually much better to gather yourself, spend a couple seconds thinking. And by the way, the customer doesn't even know, they don't notice anything. <laughs> they just notice you actually being thoughtful before you respond to their answer. Um, so that's, that's one of the things I learned from Mr. Salvo. And another thing is just being comfortable with saying you don't know things. I, I find that a lot of salespeople want to have an answer for everything and customers don't, aren't, they're not going to respect you if you're wrong. So I'd rather just say, you know, I don't know, but I can find out and then come through when you, when you're finding right. out. Um, that's, that's extremely important, but a lot of times I'm saying, I don't know. And it's strange, but customers actually, they respect that because they know you don't know everything. Nobody does. Well, <clears throat> a lot of reps say, well, how can I become more curious? And I say, I use your question. What 
don't I know? Or what do I wish I knew? Yeah, I mean, curiosity is it's something actually, I think that's pretty easy. It's like a thread that you just start unraveling. And it builds upon itself. It is asking, what don't I know? And who don't I know? And what are their motivations? What are their interests? You know, within a company, uh, I, I've worked with these large enterprises, and there are a lot of people with different priorities. And so what are, what are this individual's priorities, you know, and how do they relate to the overall company's priorities? And how are you going to help them get through that? I mean, all those things sort of go into each of the, the meetings that I have. And again, I, I probably have fewer than most people at, at the company, but I just make sure that, they're, that they count and that our message is right, that we bring the right people to the meeting. Uh, you know, a lot of companies show up with armies of people and the school customers bus. notice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, customers notice. They're like, hey, these five human beings haven't talked at all. They've been in three meetings. They haven't and said a word. They're all waiting for their moment. I guess, I guess, but uh, I try to bring more of a SWAT team and it's the people that can actually make an impact. And each one of those people, I want to speak up. I want them to participate in the meeting. I want the customer to see why they're important to them. Yeah. So it's, uh, for me, it's more a SWAT team than, than army and, and yeah, just exploring with, with those few folks. And what was your decision of as far as going into leadership versus staying an individual contributor? That's a really hard one for me. Uh, yeah. So I resisted. I resisted <laughs> leadership for a long time. And I think that my leadership probably agreed with that resistance for a while, but they kept asking. And I was asked even dating back at Apple years. And um, I think that you know, like you, I enjoy helping others understand things that they may not today and think through things that they may not have considered. And it's because we all come from different vantage points. So as that became more and more important to me, I think that that's when I pivoted into leadership and thought this I, I like this. And I think eventually I'll probably become a professor or something like that for like my dad, because I really do enjoy seeing people's growth and their own aha moments where they grasp something. And I had one of these moments actually with one of my team members yesterday, and it was a total aha and he took off from it. And I loved it. I loved yeah. it. And it wasn't because I bestowed some knowledge <laughs> on him. It's not like I have all the, you know, all the knowledge. Here you go. It's that I helped him arrive at an understanding of something which helped propel him, which helped him <laughs> like jump in and drive towards something that's bigger. And he was excited about it. And so that was, that was my reward was his, his excitement. And do you see those common patterns in reps? You know, it, it really depends on the rep. Yeah. You know, the, the reps are so different and people want to label them A player, B player, C player. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is kind of crazy. But, you know, at the end of the day, I want a team that's passionate, that is determined and that wants, like, is going to work really hard to, to achieve their objectives. And each one of those individuals is going to come in with their own set of skills and their own set of gaps. And by the way, I have a million myself. And it, it's just sort of like, they're just holes in how we approach things, how we go about them. And so it's looking at those things. And again, not looking at what they're good at because they're already good at those things, but it's looking at where they need help where they could use some assistance and helping them get to that, helping them arrive at a realization that they, they need to work in that area, but that they can accomplish it if they work hard. And how have you dealt with the, the not so fun side of leadership? Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> it, there are some challenging conversations you have to have yeah. and I actually am very comfortable with uncomfortable. I think that my team would all say he's 
you know, he'll just tell us exactly what he thinks. And a lot of leaders hide that. They think that if they put a veneer on and they just are very, very positive, that people will respond to that. And I sort of get that because there's always, you know, I guess it's always good to have somebody who's rooting them on. But, you know, you need to tell people when they're not going the right way. And I think you need to tell them early and you need to have clarity behind it. Because if you don't, you're both wasting your own time and your own effort. And maybe you could have somebody else in place who might be better, but you're also wasting theirs. It might just be that this isn't the job for them. It might be that, you know, they're better suited for somewhere else, or it might be that you just need to really share what you think and help them get better. And I think that most of the times you can help people get better, not all the time. And, you know, when you can't, there are obviously that we all have processes inside of our business, but uh, yeah, it's not perfectly fun, but it is perfectly necessary. So yeah. you just go about it and, and you try and you try to work with that person and you try to help them. And eventually if it's not working out, you know, you, you need to let them know and you need to let them know why. I think it's important. A lot of times it's sort of a, you know, you sever the relationship. And by the way, the rep severs that relationship a lot too. So, you know, right. they, they have other leave. opportunities, right? Yeah, they have other opportunities too. And by the way, I wish them well every time. I never try to trap people. I think it's crazy that companies try to trap them either internally or externally. I just yeah. want them to grow. And if they grow and do well, then I did my job, period. Uh, so, you know, it's just trying to help them along their path. And, and uh, yeah, sometimes their path doesn't align with ours and uh, might not make sense and they might find something else. But I think providing them that clarity, being very honest and direct with them about what they need to work on. And, you know, when it isn't working out, you need to let them know, of course, too. And when you're interviewing reps, what do you look for? Have you found a particular process or characteristics or... Or, or yeah. certain ones that I'll completely stay away from? Yeah, I mean, I'd say that there are all types of reps, right? So some people are very successful doing one specific, you know, yeah. they have a style. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I'm looking for, it can be summed up in a single word. And there are a lot of studies on this from a psych psychological perspective. It's grit. Yeah. It is literally grit. It's how determined are you to succeed? How hard are you willing to work? And how focused are you of, we're going to be the solution. We're going to get this business. Because at the end of the day, it's always the extra effort. And I learned this early on in my career. I have a very silly story. It actually relates back to this Muhammad Ali uh, picture with me. <laughs> from way back at a final four. And I was VIP security there. And the way that I became VIP security is the interesting part of the story. I came in, it was like 6.30. This is early on in my career. I, did, I didn't start at like a high level sales. I started in telecom and copiers. I mean, I am definitely, you know, I work my way up. Yeah. But I was going through an office park. And I was meeting people. I was working for a telecom company and it was late. It was, again, I think it was 6.30. And I went into this office and oftentimes the principals were there, the person who owned the organization or who ran that, that at least that office. And I'm sort of peeking through the office because nobody's there. I mean, the door's open, but there are no human beings. And I sort of wind my way back, but I don't want to startle. <laughs> Get some anybody. coffee. Yeah. I'm like... You know, so I'm sort of showing that I'm out of place, even in my movements going through the office. And I finally find this office way in the back. And it's this guy and he's finishing up a phone call, you know, gives me the one minute. And I wait till he's done. I'm looking around the office. I see all these silver plated shovels on his wall. And I'm thinking, huh, this guy is uh, obviously doing some building projects here. And he must be fairly important to get one of the one of these uh, silver plated shovels. So I start giving him my spiel afterward, and he said, "You know what? I don't care what our telecom costs. I, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. But I really like you. You're out here at six thirty. You had a good pitch. You're working hard, 
and I want to do something for you. Do you like basketball? I said, yeah. He goes, do you like college basketball? I said, I just graduated recently from Purdue, went to all the games, all the basketball games there. Glenn Robinson was there at the time. And he goes, hang on for a second. And he calls up Jack Swarbrick. And Jack's now the, I think he's the Notre Dame uh, athletic director. But at the time, he ran Indiana Sports Corp. And he said, Jack, I have a guy for you. And he, you know, haggles with Jack. And eventually, Jack gives in and says, okay. Uh, because I guess you had to work your way into this VIP security. Like you had to do it like three or four times before you'd even be considered. And you'd just be sort of one of the people at the doors and stuff like that. Yeah. But he got me in and it sort of told me a lot. It told me, look, hard work. It's not always rewarded, but if you work harder and you have that grit, it's definitely rewarded more often than it's not. Like if I didn't go through that, that door, I would have never had that opportunity. And so with reps, I just look for the grit. If they're gritty, I want them. I don't even care what their background is. You know, I would rather have a kid, no college background. Uh, My engineer at Apple long ago, I found out at the time, he, he went back and he actually got his degree and he's one of the smartest human beings that I know. But at the time I was asked by his manager, me and another rep, Do you mind, you know, this guy doesn't, he's great. He's so skilled, but he doesn't have a college degree. And this other rep and I looked at each other like, who cares? Right. Who cares? This guy's really, you're saying he's really smart. He's perfect for the job, but he doesn't have a piece of paper. Who cares? And and that guy, by the way, he's still at Apple. He is a phenomenal engineer and, you know, so happy we made that decision, but he was great for, for us. He was great for the business and he had grit and he had intelligence and that was good enough for us. Is there a particular signal in the interview that you were test or acid test to determine that the, the grittiness? You know, so one of the things that I usually put reps through is a similar 48 hour exercise. I actually did <laughs> nice. it to my team. I know. Isn't that terrible? I'm like, Hey, I suffered through this hell. So, so you should too. (laughs) But I had my team do that recently and it is seeing how much they can think, how hard they're going to work because it shows effort. So one rep might go and spend an hour on it and come back with a surface level, basic, doesn't really have the depth that shows I understand the customer's challenges. I understand what we can do. Here is the nirvana together. Here's the vision. And they show different levels of that. And so I think that that's a great test in enterprise sales because it does show grit. It's like, how hard are you willing to think about this? How gritty are you? And how much of a problem solver are you? Because you have to look at the businesses and, and what their challenges are. You have to consider the people that you would connect with and, and those type of things. So I wouldn't say it's a question. It's more an exercise, it's exercise yeah. uh, because I can't necessarily tell in like a half hour or even an hour, right. I know a little bit about you, right? But it's surface level. It's sort of top of mind. It's as you ask the question, I think about it. So it's not necessarily going to reveal your grit. And so I think the other exercise may do that a bit better, but who knows? Cool. Hey, Todd, I really appreciate your time today. Where can people go to connect and follow you? Uh, They can connect with me on LinkedIn, um, but uh, yeah, happy to talk with anybody. I I really enjoyed this. It's it's a lot of fun and uh, you do great work. A lot of people love seeing the the little (laughs) bits because you present a lot of reality. You know, you, you make it into a joke and the comical uh, nature of what you're presenting, I think that that's the real magic because that's why you get through to people so well is that you make it fun. And, uh, and so really enjoy the conversation.